10, 485, replay schedule, duration 25 minutes. Curiosity. Welcome to the Curiosity Show. In today's program, Rob will show you a piece of wood cut from a magic tree, and I'll turn a clothes peg into the first cousin of this horse, a donkey. Rob will use a saw with a very thin blade, but there's no need to fret, so I'm sure you'll want to stay with us for the next half hour. I have a bit of wood cut from a magic tree. It does fantastic really? things. Really? Mm. Mm. Let me show you. You see, it's got three holes. I've pushed a, a, a match through the middle one. Well, let's yes. take it out, okay? Yes. Take it out, put it on the magic handkerchief, mm -hmm. and you see there are three holes in that bit of wood. Yes. Turn it up, and you'll see those holes go all the way through. Yes, I can see that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Down again, three holes. So three holes on either side, yes. they go all the way through. Okay, take the match and poke it through the middle hole. Make sure you see it coming through the other side. Okay, middle hole. Middle hole. It's a tight fit. Okay, here it, it does comes come through. all the way through. Yes, I can see that. And notice that's the middle hole. Yes. Right, magic handkerchief over the top. Okay. Abracadabra, and it's now on the <laughs> hole nearest me. It's on your side. It is indeed. We'll put it back Amazing. in the middle one. Back in the middle. Don't okay. let it defeat you. Yeah, it won't it stay there, but... Just let me check this out. Yeah. Yes, it is the same Twirl matchstick. Around. It's you twirling better. when I twirl okay. it at the top. Middle oh. hole. Middle I'm hole. convinced. Okay, magic Open handkerchief. Abracadabra. It's now... My side. Won't stay in the middle one. That is amazing. Isn't it? I'll take it out and you can see there are still three holes. Three can holes I... there, mm -hmm. and if I turn it over, three holes there. Can I borrow the piece of wood for a moment? Uh, if you must. <laughs> <laughs> I want to check those holes. Um, you see they go through. Yes, two holes go through. There seems to be a blockage in one of them. Let me turn oh, it over. A bit of dust. Two holes go through, but a blockage <laughs> in another one. Uh, actually... When I turn it over, the positions of the hole seems to jump. Only two of them go all the way through. You're right. Well, keep it steady mm. and I'll show you what's, uh, what's going on. OK, well, you're quite right. Two holes have been drilled all the way through, that one yes. and that. Yes. On this side, at the tip, I've drilled a dead hole. It only goes <laughs> half the way through. Yes. On the other side, about there, I've yes. drilled another dead hole. Only goes half the way through. <laughs> so it looks like the same three holes on each side, but only two of them really are the same. And in fact, if I put the matchstick into that one, the middle hole on this side is not the middle hole on your side. It's in it's fact the, the one closest it. to your yes. handle. Mm. Yeah. How did you make it? It's very simple. You make one out of, uh, well, softwood's the best because it's so easy to work with. And you take a bit which is, I suppose, uh, about two fingers wide and about as long as your hand yes. and drill two holes all the way through, about yes. the same size as a matchstick, so it's a nice mm. tight fit. Yes. Then up at the tip on one side, you drill a hole half the way through. Yes. And towards the handle on the other side, you drill a hole half of the way through. Why did you paint it black? Well, that helps to disguise any little flaws in the wood that might give away which side you're looking at. It makes the whole thing look the same one side or the other. Mm, I suppose for the same reason you kept the holes away from the end. Exactly. You couldn't yes. see them jumping. You're quite right. Otherwise, it'd be too mm. obvious that they're shifting about. Mm. That's all it is. And then when you put the... Uh, match in, it appears to jump about <laughs> as you turn the thing underneath the magic handkerchief. That's a neat trick.
This weird saw is a fret saw and used at its simplest for things like this, making jigsaws, because it makes very fine cuts and it goes round sharp corners. But that is by no means the most interesting use of the fret saw, because it was used in the old days for making fret work. This is now a museum piece. It was done about the time of the First World War, and it shows the characteristics of good fret work, which are intricate design and very carefully cut out of one piece of wood. That's a memorial to Scott of the Antarctic. It's a very old piece now. Again, very intricate design. Well, the fret saw that allows you to do things like that is a weird thing indeed, but for good reason. It's uh, really a bow of steel which is sprung. So that if I release this top clamp, you can see it springs apart from the bowstring, which is really the blade, a very fine piece of steel with saw teeth all the way down. And you break those so you buy replacements and just slot them in between the two clamps. We'll get back to that later. But this is my attempt at fretwork. It's a bit rough, it's not as good as the other stuff, but it's not a bad design. Although I can't design things like that. I'm not good enough as a designer. And if you're not good enough, or you think you're not good enough, go to a friend who can design it, or go to wallpaper, because wallpaper is full of good, intricate designs. You see, there's a bit there. And in fact, it's that design that I turned into fretwork. No credit to me, it was just there on the wallpaper. And I stuck the wallpaper onto a piece of plywood, which is now what fret workers often use, and you can see it's sitting there ready to be cut out. Well, what you have to do now is to decide the bits of the design you want to lose. And I've decided, for better or worse, I'm going to cut out all the bits that are white. And I've already begun that. But you have to dismantle the saw and assemble it through the work. And to do that, you need holes, which you can drill either with a little electric drill, and that's what I used, or, if you have one, a little hand drill, which is uh, pretty well as good, or, if you're desperate, a sharp point as long as you don't go too fast and too hard and split the wood. But make a hole that's wide enough to let the saw blade through, and make a few of those through the bits of the design you want to cut out. Now comes the hardest bit of all. It's where you often break a blade. You take the piece you're going to fretwork and put it design side up, because you need to know exactly what you're, you're doing. You need to see the design. Undo that top clamp, the saw blade comes free, and you thread that up through one of the holes in your work. Here goes comes up there and you reassemble it by squeezing the saw together again, getting the blade into the top bracket there and doing it up very tightly. You'll need about five hands for this, but when you let the saw go, it springs that blade tight and you can hear it pinging and because it's tight, it'll cut well. Always make sure the teeth are pointing to the handle. It cuts on the way down. And you keep the saw jigging up and down and moving the work around and you can cut out your designs. Well, it's fairly hard working on the end of a workbench like this. You can see that the saw is as long as it is because it allows the work to be fairly large and move in and out of the saw frame. But we're too close to the edge of the table and we cut into it. So we'll just put that to one side and show you one other tool that the fret worker really needs. There's nothing more than a plank with a wedge cut out of it, like that. Because you can put that on the end of your table or your bench, clamp it on or nail it on if your bench isn't too good, but it provides you with a very handy extension. You can see why it's so good. It supports the work on the sides of that V there, supports it all the way around, and you can move the blade back and forth through a great sort of distance without mucking up the table. And that's very essential for fret working. Well, of course, saws like this aren't just used for wood. These days, you can get things like that. That's a jeweler's saw, and it was used to produce in silver this little medallion. Almost anything which has got a lattice work or holes in it has been fretworked in some way. And you can use it for perspex too. What I've been doing here is to make a couple of key rings. I've made one for myself. I've cut out the letter R from perspex, and I've cut out the middle of that letter R, again by fretworking, and I've only got to file that up and sand it and polish it, drill a hole in it, and it's going to be a key ring uh, for my name. And to show you how it works, I'm doing one for Dean. I've cut the middle of his, his D out, and uh, I'm going to finish that off because you can see the way the saw is going through the perspex, which is transparent. Well, we use this marvellous device here. I'll take this saw out of the wood and get on with that later. Once again, I've drilled a hole through the work, and I have to push the saw blade up through it. Position the work down there, squeeze the saw together, 
clamp the blade in, do up the clamp, and let the spring go. And by turning the work around and jigging the saw up and down, I can cut away around the D. Now you're going to bust a lot of blades doing this, especially when you start. It doesn't matter because you can go along to the hardware store and for a few cents buy a replacement one. There it is. The saw itself, you can get that new if you like, but you often find them in second-hand shops. Grab them. They may cost you a few dollars, but by making key rings for presents and jigsaws for your local fate, you'll get your money back and you'll restore the ancient art of fretworking. was a clothes peg donkey and you can make one using a few odds and ends from around the home. The first thing you'll need of course is a clothes peg, preferably a wooden one. You can use a plastic one but a wooden one is better because you'll be attaching things to it with drawing pins and it's easier to push those into wood than into plastic. Talking about drawing pins you'll need two of them and you'll also need a paper clip and a matchstick and you'll need two pieces of cardboard about five centimeters square, fairly stiff and white and some colored pens and that matchstick you can cut that into thirds because you only need one little piece of it and that's all you need you will need a pair of scissors as a tool here's what you do first of all you take your black pen and mark some grass across the base of one of the pieces of cardboard there we are and then you draw the body of a donkey above the grass don't worry about the head, don't worry about the, t the tail, just the body. So there's the back leg coming up there, there's the rear end, here's the back of the donkey, there's the neck end, there's the front leg, you come up here, there we are, and I think you'll agree with me, it does look a little bit like the body of a donkey. You can then colour it in, use any colour you like. You'll notice that I used, not surprisingly, a green pen for the grass, and a yellow pen for the body of the donkey. There we are. Well, I've already done that with my donkey over here. Coloured it in completely, and you'll notice that I've cut away a little piece there. That's important because the working mechanism needs the paper clip to go down on that side of the donkey. So then you cut around the body of the donkey and you remove that little piece from between the legs, and you're ready to start assembling that. Now to do that, you bend that over and then you're going to attach it to the clothes peg. Now here, this one's already cut out neatly. Bend that over, take one of the drawing pins and push it through the base. There we are. And attach it to the clothes peg in this position so that the donkey points forward. Now, nothing is happening yet, but you can see that the lower part of the jaws of the clothes peg can now open and they're clear of the base of the grass. Now, the next thing to do, of course, is to draw the head of a donkey. Now, that's relatively easy. You simply draw a couple of long ears like that and a long droopy face. The neck goes down there. Make the neck much longer than it would normally be and round it off like so. Then an eye, mouth, 
nose. There we are. Once again, cut that out and colour it. You guessed it, I've already done it. There we are. You'll notice I've made a couple of little holes there with the point of the scissors. Those are important. That little piece of matchstick that we talked about is actually going to work as a kind of a hinge or pivot. And that goes through the neck part of the donkey here, push it through, and onto the back of that, you attach the real neck of the donkey. There we are. You can now see that it's starting to look like a donkey, but it's not moving, can't move yet until you place onto it the paper clip. Now before you do that, straighten out the paper clip like so. That end there will attach to the neck and this end will attach to the peg, but you'll need to try bending it backwards and forwards until you get it just the right length. Here's one where I've measured the length and I know that that will take me from the neck of the donkey down to the bottom part of the peg. Here's what I do. Turn the donkey around backwards, push that end of the paper clip through the second hole in the neck, that one there, and then lead it down, pull it around there, and lead it down alongside the peg to the bottom part. Now we get the head of the donkey in the down position, almost as if it's eating grass, and then take the second drawing pin and place that through the little loop that I've made and into the side of the lower part of the peg. There it is there. Believe it or not, our donkey is almost complete. Oh, one thing's missing, isn't it? Can you see what that is? No tail on the donkey. But we can remedy that situation very quickly. Now our friend the donkey has a red tail. Watch what happens to his head as I move the two halves of the peg together. Here we go. All right, the head moves up and down. And it does that, of course, because the lower part of the peg is pulling down via the paper clip on the back part of the neck, and the whole thing acts as a little seesaw. Well, you'll have fun making a donkey of that type, and also you can, if you like, make a little piece of cardboard like this and hide your hand behind it so that your friends can't see exactly what's happening uh, to make the donkey's head move. But I'll tell you what else I want you to do. See if you can design a donkey that has not only a moving head, but also a moving tail. that I could remember what I was going to wish for. But while I'm thinking about it, do you know why people shut their eyes when they wish? At least most people do. Well, apparently, the story goes back a very long time, to the days when people used to worship the sun. And because the sun brought warmth and it brought life, people thought it brought good things generally. So when they wanted something, they'd turn to the sun and wish towards the sun. And of course, if you're facing the sun, it's very glary, and you have to have your eyes shut. And so they wished with their eyes shut. And these days, the customs continued. People still wish with their eyes shut.
Rob, three plastic cups mm -hmm. and a cardboard disc which is smaller than the rim of each cup. Right. Move them around anywhere you like on the table and end up with one of the cups covering completely the disc. I'll close my eyes, right. but I'll then uh, be able to identify the disc within seconds. Uh, done. You ready? Right, uh, the disc is under that cup. Very good. Mm. Look away, I'll try it again. Again, OK? Yep. Here we go. No squizzing now. Anywhere you um, like. Anywhere you I'm like. Very careful where I put this thing. I'd say within and two seconds this time I should be able to identify. Right. You ready? Under this one. How are you doing that? Is there a hole in the cup you can see through? No, no hole. That looks all right. Um, and the cups are identical. A mark on the disc, perhaps. I can't can you see, see one. anything. No, I can't see anything. No, you can't. But if I used a light-coloured table rather than a dark table... Aha! Uh -huh. Is that hair <laughs> anything to do with it? It certainly is. You see, there's a little piece of hair sticking out there, and no matter how you place the cup over it, the hair will always be visible. That's all I had to look for. In fact, the cardboard disc is not one disc, but two discs, which are exactly the same size. I cut them out together with a pair of scissors, and I placed one of my dark hairs on there, held it in place with a piece of tape, and then glued the two pieces together. If you have dark hair, use a dark table. If you have blonde hair, use a light table. <laughs> Try it on your friends. Goodbye. Curiosity.